There has been a lot of horses on my Twitter feed lately, and some of my friends had been talking about it too. So, last weekend, my friend asked, Do zebras count as horses? Can you use a zebra in a horse race? And I was like, What? So, let me bring up the question for you, my dear friend. What exactly is horse? Depends on who you ask, you could get a different scientific answer to what a horse is. And you could argue that all of those answers are correct. Depends on the context, that is. So, horse is classified in the perisodactyla order, that is, the autoungulates. If we're talking about extant animals, there are three groups of autoungulates, belonging to different families. Those are the rhinos, rhinocerotidae, the tapirs, tapiridae, and of course, the horses, equidae. So, some would consider the whole family as horses. There is only one extant genus in this family, which is Equus. But there are several extinct genera, of course, which is why some would consider the genus Equus as horse. If we go down one more step, there are currently seven recognized species of Equus. Three of those are zebras, three are asses, you know, donkeys, and the other one is Equus ferus the quote-unquote true horse. So, some would only consider this species as horse. But yeah, like I said, it depends on the context. Zoologists could use the term horse to talk about them in the family level, genus level, or even species level. While we're talking about taxonomy, I would also like to tell you that some people consider domestic horse to be its own species, which would be Equus cabalus. I personally have been using Equus ferus cabalus, but yeah, just to clarify. Oh, by the way, in case you are curious, Equus means horse, Ferus means wild, and Cabalus is the Latin term for pack horses. If we're talking about domestic horse, then sure, you can find them basically anywhere. However, if we're talking about wild horse, they were once widespread in mainland Eurasia, but their population significantly declined. In fact, the only living population of wild horse the Purzewalski source was also considered extinct in the wild, but then successfully reintroduced. It's the prime example of successful reintroduction. But yeah, we've been talking about their taxonomy and distribution, but what exactly makes them horse? You know, what makes them distinct from other species? Well, let's talk about their morphology. As with other Perisodactyla members, they are auto. Well, that's not exactly the case. The technical diagnostic character is they bear their weight with odd number of toes. In the case of horse, they only have one large toe, and one is an odd number, so it's not gonna be confusing. I'm pretty sure you're already familiar with the equid's general form, right? Long and muscular neck, relatively long hairy tail, and relatively slender legs. But then, the question is, how do you differentiate horse from the other species? That would require a more specific knowledge, but it's not exactly too difficult. The three species of zebras have white fur with black stripes all over their body. Or, you know, depends on how you look at it, the opposite would be correct for you. But anyway, if you see that kind of equids, that's definitely not a horse. The African wild ass, Equus africanus, have white legs with black stripes. Think about a donkey with zebra legs, basically. Oh, and Donkeys are domesticated from these species, which is why their form is very similar. You know, the large ear of the donkey. Now, let's talk about the trickier one, Kiang and Onager. These two are more horse-like, but these two are still asses. The relatively easy way to tell asses and horses apart is by looking at their back. Asses have a relatively straight back, while horses have curvier back. This part here, called wither, is especially important. For what? Well, to feed a saddle. But yes, wither is the ridge between shoulder blades. This part usually has thickened muscles in horse, while in asses, the wither is usually relatively flat. It's also easy to spot if you look at their skeleton. Look at the thoracic spine. Notice how the thoracic spines of horses are significantly higher compared to asses, especially this part right here. And yes, this is the wither. So, if you are wondering whether what you are looking at is a horse or an ass, 
just look at their back. I say that because with all of those horse breed available, just looking at their color is not enough to make sure. Oh, while we're at it, I would also like to point out that Urziwaski's horse have striped legs, but their leg is not white, so you wouldn't think of African ass or zebra if you look at them. So yeah. Next, let's talk about their lifestyle and behavior. But before that, Wild horses are quite resilient and have high environmental tolerance. While they are typically known to prefer open habitat like steppes, they could also live in temperate forests and tundra. Because they mainly live on steppes, they are mainly grazers, but they can also eat shrubs. Horses live in herds. Usually, the herd consists of one stallion, that's mature male horse by the way, around 4 to 5 mares, that's mature female horse, and their offsprings. That's why a horse herd is often called horror, because one stallion have multiple mares. Anyway, towards reaching 3 years old, young horses will leave their original herd, or forced to leave the herd in some cases. Young males will form bachelor group, where they live and play together. Meanwhile, females will join another herd, and usually will already mate at around 3 years old. Gestation period lasts for around one year. Back to the male's bachelor group, they will go their own way at around five years old. And of course, each form their own herd, if they successfully survive, that is. There's not much predator that would hunt horses, but wolves are good hunters. And of course, they are the main predator for horses. So, if I ask you, what's usually associated with horses? What are horses known for? Most of the answers can be generalized into three things. Speed, power, stamina. Well, some might answer hungry, but to those who answer hungry, I would like to ask you, how hungry? Okay, that's just a Twitter meme. Let's stop horsing around. Speed, power, stamina. Let's look at this. How true are those answers actually? Let's talk about speed first. In reality, Onagers are actually faster than horses. Onager can gallop twice as fast as horses, if we're talking about natural horses at least. I'm not talking about race horses, because those are specifically bred and trained for racing. So, horse is not the fastest among the equids. Now let's talk about power. Horse power is a real unit after all, so are they really that powerful? The answer is, yeah compared to other equids at least. Some would argue asses, especially pack donkeys, will be stronger than horses. But that's if we're talking about their size relative to how much they could carry or pull. It's like when scientists are saying ants are very strong because they could carry an object multiple times heavier than their own body. But that doesn't really matter practically because, well, a single ant wouldn't be able to carry a water bottle, while you can easily do so, right? That's also the case for horses. Horses are generally bigger than asses. Hence, horses are usually, practically, more powerful. Some people would say zebras are stronger than horses, but that's not overall power. That's their kicking force. Horses are overall more powerful than zebras. Oh, and while we're talking about power, one horse actually does not equate to one horse power. One horse is actually almost 15 horsepower. So yeah, it is what it is, I guess. Okay now, that's power, but what about stamina? Well, for this one, I would argue asses have better stamina. It really depends on the definition of stamina though. Asses are adapted to rough terrains, hence why they are more durable. Also, if you are wondering why donkeys are preferred as pack animals, it's because they are durable. And more importantly, they don't consume as much energy as horses. They don't need to eat and drink that much. Meanwhile, horses do eat a lot, even when being compared to cattle. On average, horses eat 63% more than cattle. So yeah, hungry would actually be a fitting answer. Okay, so we as a person in this era have our own answer to what is associated with horse. But the question is, why did our predecessors started to domesticate horse? Let's talk about it. The topic about when did we start domesticating horse is actually quite contested. 
it really depends on what exactly is the threshold of domestication. Some would argue herding wild animals are already domesticating. Some would argue that domestication starts when we purposefully breed them for our own purpose. The latest publication that I read stated that the earliest domestication of horses happened in 2000 BC. Earlier publications stated it's around 3000 BC or even 3500 BC. So yeah, like I said, there's no generally accepted consensus yet. The generally accepted consensus is the fact that it started somewhere in the Eurasian steppe, and the fact that we started domesticating horse not because they are fast, strong, or durable, but simply because they are a source of food. Yes, horses were domesticated for their meat and milk. Very general indeed. But of course, as most of you should probably know, we started using them as pack animals, and also as transportations of course, including during wars. When you think about cavalry, you would imagine a guy riding a horse, right? Not camels or elephants, even though that's also a thing. As time goes by, the consumption of horse meat and milk dissipates. Now, we mostly know horse as pack animals, or simply as pet, maybe. Well, to be fair, at the current day, horses are probably associated with horse racing, because a certain game got released globally last week. Like I said, my Twitter feed is filled with horses, which is quite funny because Monster Hunter Wild's title update also got released. But anyway, I've been mentioning Eurasia a lot in this video, but actually, Eurasia is not the origin of horses. Let's talk about their evolution. To be fair, Horse evolution is often depicted in school textbooks as the secondary example of evolutionary transition. I say it's secondary because the primary example would be the transition from fishes to amphibian. But anyway, what's not typically known about horse evolution is the fact that it happened in the America. And so, there's a lot of horse fossil in America. Well, back to the first topic, it really depends on what you consider a horse. Those fossils are not of the same species. Some are not even the same genus. If you are wondering how could they disperse to Eurasia from North America, there's a thing called Bering Land Bridge that forms towards the Pleistocene period. At that time, the ancestor of horses already diverged from the ancestor of asses and zebras. So yeah, some would consider that as horse. The American horses went extinct during the late Pleistocene, around 12,000 years ago while the Eurasian horse survived. By the way, some authors also considered some American Equus to be Equus ferus, same species as the Eurasian Equus, while some assigned them to some distinct species. Some of you might have heard about Mustang, the horse that currently exists in America. But I say the American horse went extinct. So what about Mustang? Well, let's talk about Mustang. Mustangs are technically not wild horse. Mustangs are feral horse. It's domestic horses that don't live in captivity, just free roaming in the wilderness. Mustangs used to be colonial Spanish horses, you know, the one used by the conquistadors, which were released because they are no longer needed. Mustang as a word came from the Spanish word mestengo or mesteño. I'm not exactly sure, but the point is, it means stray animals, which is self-explanatory of course. Nowadays, different breed of horses from breeders in America also contributes to the population of Mustangs. So yeah, if you want to be technically correct, don't call them wild horse. The actual wild horse, the only population that currently exists, is the Pursiwalski's horse. So let's talk about that. Pursiwalski's horse are mostly considered their own subspecies. Some assign them as a distinct species though, but that's not commonly accepted. Pursiwalski's horse is depicted in many archaeological relics and even cave arts, so they have been there for quite a while, and more widely distributed too. In case you are wondering, the name came from Nikolai Pursiwalski, which was a famous Russian explorer in his time. He was the one who had the original specimen. That was around 1880. Some were then captured and placed in zoos. Years later, early 1900s, there were no reports of their population in the wild for several decades. 
Almost 50 years later, several individuals were observed, and so scientific expeditions were done to find them. But nope, not a single sighting. But hey, surely there are still many Purtsiwalski sources in captivity, right? Well, unfortunately, also no. Purtsiwalski sources were also used during world wars. By the end of 1950s, there were only 12 individuals left, and those are separated in multiple zoos. People then started purposively breeding them, exchanging individuals from different zoos to conserve the genetic diversity. And so, 10 years later, there were around 130 individuals. In 1977, the foundation of the preservation and protection of the Pursiwaski source was founded. They started to seriously put an effort on Pursiwaski source conservation. They still have an active website, by the way, if you are interested to read about them. Years later, multiple parties tried to reintroduce Pursiwaski source to the wild. This came from China, Mongolia, and also the Western European countries. In 2005, Pursiwaski source's conservation status was elevated from extinct in the wild to endangered. This effort is still going on even to this day, to different locations. They even cloned Pursiwaski's horse to assist this effort. Observation back in 2020 reported around 1,114 Pursiwaski's horse in the wild. Who knows how many are there this year? Hope they continue to thrive. Okay, so, to answer my friend's question, no, a zebra wouldn't be allowed in a horse race. It's simply because horse races have their own rules. I believe only specific breeds could compete but I'm not exactly sure. I mean, I'm just a zoologist, not a horse racer, not a horse breeder, not even a horse racing enthusiast. However, what I can say is, there are some hybrids of horses. Not just breeds, but hybrids. Male horse and female donkey makes hinny. Male horse and female zebra makes hebra. Female horse and male donkey makes mule and female horse and male zebra makes zors. So yes, that's why mules are often used as pack animals. They have the durability of donkeys while having the strength of horses. Well, not exactly, but that's the idea at least. I'm not gonna talk about domestic horses breeds though. Horse breeding is quite complicated. You should ask a horse breeder about that, not a zoologist like me, especially because domestic horse is not my field. But yeah, that's the general information about horses. I didn't expect the video to be this long to be honest. But hey, hope you learned something new. And yeah, that's all for now. Oh by the way, in case you are wondering, the thumbnail is a Japanese racehorse called Agnes Takio. Not sure why you would want to know though, but hey, maybe you do. Anyway, enjoy your day.